that have been to our Future 50 events before, we normally have a speaker, a spot of lunch and a bit of networking and then, and then people disperse. But today is a bit special because we want to take this opportunity, with it being the finale, to do something slightly different. Um, and the slightly different is uh, we're going to hear not only from a great speaker today, but we're also going to hear from a number of colleagues about the, the launch of our You Can, Can Foundation proper. Um, and then we're also going to hear from Mick and uh, assisted by a couple of colleagues as well after lunch um, uh, on his reflections of the last 50 years. So a different agenda means a slightly different guest list. Um, and we've got some important VIPs. Actually, every one of you here is a VIP. But we've got a number of some, and some really lovely to see some old friends, young old friends, that is, in the audience, of course. Um, so some Bromford alumni colleagues that have made, paid a massive contribution to the Bromford journey so far. And also um, some of our current colleagues who are our award winners, our DNA um, B Bromford award winners from the Bash this year. So all of you are very, very welcome to the event today. So a little bit about running order. Um, what that will mean is the format for the day will be Paul. Um, Paul is going to speak for us for, for a while. Then we're going to have a break. Um, Paul's going to pick up and, and cover some other aspects. And I'll, I'll leave Paul to sort of tell you what those are going to be after the break with a, a Q&A um, at the end of that. Then we're going to have a gang of colleagues and I think a customer is hopefully joining us. Um, yeah, Rowan's joining us as well to talk about the uh, the UCAN Foundation. So um, really pleased about that. Then we'll be breaking for a bit of lunch and Mick is going to join us as so assisted after that. So and we're wrapping up at about quarter past two, but you are very welcome to stay after that to uh, to follow up on any um, any networking and, and socialising really that you that you'd like to do. Okay, so that sound okay for a format? So you've got a break in about uh, 40 minutes' time. Um, so the journey so far, the Future 50 journey so far, we started off with David Smith, for those of you here. J David gave us a very large, very broad, very wide view of the future. Um, and what that view was, that was about uh, everything from economics, politics, demography, um, from a, well, I think it was probably more universal than, than global perspective. Uh, so, so David started us off, and then we started to hone down on some specific areas and our next speaker was Grant Lieboff who focused on on marketing for us we had a great session with Grant and followed by that was Mike um, Mike Ryan who then took us on a, a look at digital into the future um, Mike was the guy if you remember I met on Radio 4 talking to John Humphreys one morning and by by nine o'clock I'd booked him for a, a session on the on the future on the future 50 that'll teach him to go on the, <laughs> the radio so uh, expose him himself like that to the outside world so so yeah that was a, a great presentation as well there so um, what would love you to do today is unlike most of the conferences please do get your phones out tweet yammer um, post anything on our LinkedIn future 50 pages you'd like to so so feel free for, free to do that so um, we have got um, our own celebrity in the um, in the audience today who's Winnie Bago apparently has had, we've had to move off the car park couldn't get through the barriers and that's Mick because for those of you that know Mick has been on a bit of a media frenzy this week following his controversial open Open letter, which attracted the uh, the title of flamboyant. So Mick is now our flamboyant. Um, and when when um, unfortunately Paul was running slightly late this morning, I did say to Mick, "Is there anything flamboyant you could do to sort of keep everybody uh, everybody warmed up until until Paul arrives?" So Mick, you'll be uh, you'll be joining us after after lunch. So Mick's here as well um, with us on the on the front row. Just, just of course. I try and do this in the most flamboyant way. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, the Guardian have run a, a major major piece on my open letter to uh, to government, and more of that later on this afternoon. And in that, I'm described amongst other things as Ian Duncan Smith's favourite housing association boss <laughs> and the flamboyant Nick. I didn't know I was. <laughs> I just want to add, really, to what Helena has said. A fantastic. Uh, day ahead for everybody and particular welcome. So many of you uh, new friends and some of you um, uh, older new friends as well that have been part of this Bromford journey, fantastic Bromford story over the last 50 years. So thank you ever so much for everybody who's making it to join us today. Um, we are live streaming on the internet, so as well as the colleagues in the room today, some colleagues will be watching us, as well as my mum and dad, on the uh, <laughs> on the internet, which is good because it keeps them at home, not out spending my time, <laughs> which I really don't want them to be doing. So, uh, 
Um, so that's good news. So yeah, we are live streaming on the internet as well. So hello to uh, colleagues that are joining us on the on the internet. Um, just a little introduction to Paul. I'm sure Paul will tell you a bit more about himself. But Paul is the founder and CEO of Ella's Kitchen. You have probably seen their products when you're out shopping. Um, I met Paul in Germany, and it wasn't another of my 18 to 30s holidays, because uh, I have explained that my birth certificate does slightly exempt me now, only by just a couple of years from that, but we were both speaking at a conference, and Paul made the terrible mistake of getting into a taxi with me to the airport, because uh, he hadn't even checked in. I've got his number, his Twitter handle, and I've got Paul as well, So, um, and the rest is history. So uh, a very big welcome to, to Paul. We are very lucky to have Paul today, because if I tried to book him a couple of uh, months earlier, well, not that long ago, Paul was at the One, one, one Young, Young World, World Conference um, in South Africa, where Paul was on the same platform as Richard Branson, Jamie Oliver, and someone, when I excitedly emailed my team about this, came out as Coffee Anna. And uh, they thought it was somebody that was serving the drinks. No, it was obviously Kofi Annan, which had got mixed up in the uh, it mixed up in the uh, spell check there. So uh, uh, I did, uh, we did we did uh, establish the, what that was in the end. So, and that was a conference of 1,500 young people who are selected to be identified as being the next big world influencers and leaders of our uh, of the next generation so so fantastic so we're very lucky so what Paul's decided to do he's upped his game a bit and come to Bromford and rub shoulders uh, uh, with the gang here at, here at Bromford so I'm going to hand over now to Paul who will uh, take you on the Ella's, uh, Ella's kitchen journey thank you very much for that. Um, so this is the first time I've ever been to Wolverhampton and I haven't seen a lot of it yet <laughs> And the reason, the honest reason why I've never been is because Wolver Wol Wolves has always been in a higher division than my football team. So uh, that's a lifetime of disappointment with Sheffield United. But um, So hopefully we'll be in the same division one year and hopefully I'll come back. But the thing I can, if I go away now and never come back, the thing I'll tell people is about the warmness and the flamboyancy of, 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 of people in Wolverhampton. Um, so... Um, I guess I'm in the privileged and the disadvantaged position of being um, the last person in, in this, this tour of, of this year, your 50th birthday, um, uh, and the future 50, in that I don't know exactly what the others said, so I hope I don't repeat exactly what they've said, but I also equally am nervous that I'm going to be way off piece that you're thinking, well, how does this link with the other things, but, but we'll see. But the, the thing that I thought I could contribute to was thinking about um, leadership and thinking about the businesses of the future, the new businesses of the future, and what they might look like. And I, I guess I can cheat by thinking, well, my business um, and the success that we've had to date uh, might epitomize the, the, the things that are important in businesses and how you construct a business that will be for the future. So I'll take you through the story of how Ella's Kitchen was born and grew and what our future we think it is. Um, and then after the break, take go through um, s some things about leadership, really. And and I, I you know, I just sort of copped on that that with with the you can program. You know, I'm assuming there's a lot of young people there um, with ideas that that we can get out and do do things. And that those leadership skills that they'll need for the future are things that hopefully will come through with what I, I'll say. So hopefully this works. Yeah. So um, happy fiftieth. Who, who's been here the longest in the, the, the 50 years? Who, 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 who gets the... <laughs> there are the 10-year oh, people um, involved. Yes, okay, good stuff. So lots of history there. So you, you've done the 40th and stuff. Well, I, I sort of ha had a, a, a look around and I think, well, who else is 50? It's a great, it's a, a great birthday. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not too far away from myself. Um, but um, I noticed Doctor Who was born in the same year as uh, you guys, and he's um, managed to uh, reinvent himself many times as, as different circumstances and different um, different uh, challenges came along, and I'm sure yourselves have done that. But I also thought, found that in 1963, you're in, in a very beautiful set of um, people's company. Uh, so you have Don Johnny Depp, and you have George Michael, you have Lisa Kudrow, uh, and Brad Pitt, as beautiful people are all 50 this year, so you can have one big bash together, and... Um, <laughs> And uh, I might I'm part get arrested of. if I stalk around. <laughs> <laughs> Just find him on a on a radio in a taxi somewhere on a radio station. So um, I thought I'd start really by thinking about 1963, 50 years ago, um, and I'd love over lunch to find out the the, the genesis and how how um, Bromford started. Um, 
But I, I look back at 1963 as, as, as my starting point in thinking, how am I going to approach today? And I sort of ask myself the question, has the world fundamentally changed, or are we fundamentally the same? And I looked at some events from 1963 and some, some things that happened and, and things that are happening now, and, and I thought, well, I'll just leave it for us all to decide in our own minds, but I, I thought I'd just take us through a few things. So, first of all, in 1963, we had uh, a, a charismatic orator uh, from African-American background who uh, wowed the world. Um, but he was speaking about a subject that seems very alien to us these days, about equal rights in America and, and equal voting rights. Um, so, so is it the same or is it the different? Um, but they got you know, uh, 250,000 people out on the streets of Washington that day. Um, then I saw that um, America was involved in a war with a small Asian country that it got embroiled in that it couldn't win and didn't really know how to get out of. And I thought, is that very different or is that exactly the same? What have what we learned over the last 50 years? Um, so, so maybe that's more the same. Um, anyone recognize the guy in the middle? Oh. Yes, Ron Howard. He was directing films back in 1963 with his father, who was a film director. Um, still going. Still some great films. That scene is in Baghdad. So there was a coup in, in Iraq that, uh, that year where uh, the Ba'ath Party came to power. And there were tanks on the streets, and there was unrest, and there was all sorts of violence. And I'm not sure that that has changed fundamentally for the Iraqi people in the last 50 years. The White House had a, a glamorous young couple who promised hope and promised change and promised a new, a new future. Uh, and Britain had a, a new band. Um, and I've got teenage children, and um, the last few years, uh, One Direction apparently are the new Beatles. Uh, but they did take a, they did take America like someone like Robbie Williams hasn't done, and um, you know maybe we've got um, we've got the new Beatles coming. But but British talent in in, in the creative arts is I think a, a thing that we all should be proud of in the long term, and it's lasted much more than 50 years. And unfortunately, we have natural disasters. We've obviously had a terrible one in this last week, um, and that was in a similar part of the world in 1963 in Bali. Um, where uh, very similar things happened and uh, very similar issues about um, helping those people and, and getting aid to those people happened. So really, you know, that, that doesn't change. But one change I found was um, the mini-TV, uh, which I guess I'm going to claim as the first time we started getting personal sort of entertainment, personal communication systems, came out in Japan. Um, and they were given to people in hospital beds for some reason. Uh, maybe it was a, a test thing, but it was the very first uh, mobile TVs. Now, this, this picture really intrigued me. So in 1963, there was a um, newspaper strike in America, 150-odd days, and it struck me that, that without newspapers, in those days, people couldn't get news, really. Um, all the population wouldn't have had a television. They would have had radio. Uh, obviously, they didn't have computers or anything. So, so how did they get their news? So this was the day after the strike had broken, and so on the way to work. And it just struck me that that scene it, it looks so dated these days. It's fundamentally men. I think there's one lady there. Um, they're all dressed the same. They're all middle-aged white. They're all got hats on and, and their glasses, and they're all very conservative, let's say. But there was a uniformity to society maybe then, um, uh, and maybe privilege for certain people that you know, um, maybe has diminished. We, we can all take our views about that. Um, this lady was a 21-year-old girl in, in the south of America who wanted to have breakfast and wanted to pay to have breakfast in a, in she, in a, in a diner. And uh, she sat there for six hours and was ignored and then arrested uh, just for being uh, black in the south and wanting breakfast in a white-only um, uh, diner. 1963 saw the end of the uh, Mercury space program um, and the beginning of Apollo, I think, the next year. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the moon landing was six years away then, and when we look back, it must be 44 years backwards. Um, and, you know, there must have been great excitement then about the things that could have been achieved, and I bet they would bet by the time we get to 2013, we'd be on Mars and we'd be elsewhere, and things have kind of slowed down there. Uh, Kennedy went to the Berlin Wall, and we were right in the middle of the Cold War. Um, and 
the Berlin Wall and the Cold War uh, strike out to me, and um, I, I graduated in 1989, and I did politics, and I did Eastern European politics for a lot of that, and I'd just done my exam that summer, and the bloody wall came down about two months later, <laughs> and the whole thing was like, a history, did history, not politics. Um, but uh, but that, that, that fear of, uh, you know, a, a press of a button and a nuclear war and, and, and the two sides squaring up to each other, you know, has, has really disappeared to a different kind of fear that we have these days. But, but uh, there's, a, there's a fundamental fear, but I think it's a different one. And then politicians themselves. This is Robert Kennedy, who, uh, as Attorney General, encouraged um, uh, public uh, um, displays and public um, gatherings uh, to, to get democracy across, and I don't know whether we see that these days or not, maybe it's done a different way with Twitter and things, um, but public engagement in policy is one, one thing there I thought about. Um, this picture, um, this was the first ever heart valve uh, operation, successful operation, I think it was another six or so years before a heart transplant happened, but um, that was, a, that was a, a huge thing. Now, the, the medical advances, the pharmaceutical advances, the technology advances means that that thing is probably about this size now and can be done by a surgeon at the other side of the world in real time and, and the patient has a, a much better chance of recovery, I'm sure. I, I put this in <coughs> really thinking, you know, a lot of this is about the civil rights in the US, but my thought when I saw this was religion as hate. And, you know, we've got a, a, a different set of issues with religion and, and, and strife between people these days. But, you know, religion was tied up in those days um, with uh, a symbol of, of, of discrimination then. And, you know, that kind of is so... I'm surprised that's only 50 years ago. Um, scenes like that, people prepared to go out publicly and get support for, for, for causes like that. Um, 63 saw a president shot. Um, and the thing that struck me there, he was in an open... Um, open car uh, and relatively few um, police around. I was in New York about a month ago and I had the fortune or misfortune, whichever you want to look at it, um, to kind of come across Obama's ca uh, cavalcade as he came through and the security around that, there must have been 100, 150 uh, cars around, blacked out uh, limousine, uh, going very, very fast and all the roads around closed and obviously uh, that wasn't the case in 1963. Then I thought about some of the people that um, would recognize these days. And I thought, have they changed or are they different? Um, and 1963 saw the Rivonia trial in South Africa of M Nelson Mandela and his, um, his comrades. And um, you know, he, he was charged with, uh, with violent offenses, with armed struggle. And he was seen as a terrorist. And then you know, he's, still, he's still around. And he's, he's now, his legacy now will be as a humanitarian and as humanity and how over that time perception of who he is and what he stands for, the same person, is, is, is very, very different. Um, I thought about it too in terms of the Queen. You know, she, she'd been on the throne for 10 years and actually was the Queen of a lot of the world still in 1963. African independence, Asian independence hadn't really happened by then. And um, she was extremely popular. And in the time since then, the royals have lost a lot of popularity and maybe the Queen has regained a lot of that popularity in that cycle. Maybe it's a cycle or maybe it's just to do with individuals or maybe it's to do with us as a society and our relationship to a monarchy. But she's still there um, these, these 50 years later. And then I thought about somebody who isn't still here but he, we had um, a, a Prime Minister who uh, was from uh, the establishment who went to Eton who went to Oxford and whose cabinet was still full of Eton and Oxford people. And I wondered just how much we have changed. Um, right at the very top of society. And I, th I heard it on the news this morning. There's, um, there's something that John Majors brought up um, about that, that challenge to society. So, so that was a, a, a tour, really, of um, th those things that we can think, have they changed or have, are they the same? Um, then I just looked at some sort of ordinary snaps from people um, from 1963 and now. And I assume this was like an office party or something after work and people just having a few beers and having fun in 1963. Um, is, that, is that what it's like at five, five o'clock on a Friday here? All right, that's lunchtime. Maybe this is the evening then these days here. Um, but people are doing exactly the same thing, you know, and um, we rewind in, uh, unwind in the same way. 
And children too, you know, innocent children, they're mesmerized by something, excited by something, shouting, all concentrating. And kids are obviously exactly the same now because we're people and in 50 years evolution hasn't really um, hit and we, we, in 50 years time, will still be fundamentally the same. So, you know, we can, we can talk about it at lunch break, we talk about it on Twitter, but has the world changed fundamentally? Which I think was my thought as I, as I started thinking about today. Um, but then I came through a lot of things that are actually the same um, and the way we work. So um, you can have a think about that. And then going forward uh, 50 years, it's sort of what, what will be. And um, you know, if, I, I'm sure the changes in 50 years, I'm sure if you look back, if you looked in 1963 at 2013, you'd be surprised by some things. Some things will come of left field and you'd be really disappointed by some things. And um, for those of us old enough to remember tomorrow's world, um, be fascinating to look back on YouTube videos to see what things um, came through and what things didn't. But I'm sure the things in 2063 will be uh, not exactly as we as we think. So um, I think going through to 2063, um, leadership is the thing I picked on a number of politicians and a number of leaders in the last 50 years, and I'm fascinated by whether the skill set that they had and the opportunities they had are going to be the same for the next generation of our leaders, and that's what I'll sort of talk about um, after our break. Um, but before that, I want to talk about Ellis Kitchen, and I want to ask you to hold on tight, because I've got a lot of slides to go through, and I've got a little five-minute warning that, um, that I'll get even faster with. But um, if we can, we can hold on, we'll, we'll, we'll talk through. Um, I'll just give you a very quick background of um, everything leading up to that taxi drive, that fateful taxi drive in Germany. Um, so I was born in 1966. Um, so three years away from 50. Um, I, in the UK, and I, I was brought up in Zambia, so I have a big African connection um, and have worked in the UK for a very long time. I started studying pathology at university, one of the three universities that does it in the UK, and worked out very quickly. It was a bad idea, and, and then moved on to economics and politics, or, or history as it became, as soon as I did it. Did it. Um, and uh, worked then at KPMG, accountants, became a chartered accountant for uh, six, seven years. Uh, learnt uh, the, um, the value of a, uh, a, a, a financial background. And then I went to work for Nickelodeon for 10 years. And it was a very small uh, new industry at the time. Uh, television, multi-channel television, Sky had just come along. Children's dedicated chil uh, television was, was brand new. Um, and whilst I was there, the sort of digital revolution started and we started to have websites and we started to have different channels. Um, and I started as the finance guy and ended up as the, uh, as the um, managing director of the UK. And then I used some of all of that background and experience, I guess, um, to create Ella's Kitchen because I had a family and I was going through the things that we do at Ella's Kitchen as, as, a, as a consumer. And um, so that was a, a tour de force of my brief life, um, uh, which culminates in Ella's Kitchen. And um, so. Uh, if, you're, if you've got an under five-year-old, um, you'll have heard of us, and hopefully you'll have used us. Um, and uh, if you uh, don't know about that, then we make baby food. We make baby food and toddler food. Uh, we make organic baby and toddler food. In fact, we make the best <laughs> organic baby <laughs> toddler food. Um, and uh, I think we're a very modern company, and I'll leave you to judge that, but I think we're a f company for the future and that we'll succeed in the future because of the things that we'll go through in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, and as I'm doing that, and as I was putting this together, I thought, you know, even though it's a very different industry to Bromford, I can see there are very similar things that is about the protection of our business and the appeal of our business to our customers and our society in, in, in the future. So we'll see if, if there is that overlap. So how did Ella start? It started from two places, really, two bits of experience that I had. In my personal life, I had Ella, my, my daughter, my first child. Um, uh, and my wife and I um, had challenges in weaning her. Um, she was fine for the first three or four months of weaning, and then she decided everything she had to that day was not good and spat it out uh, and wouldn't try anything new. And first time parents, um, we thought we'd got the child from hell and thought she was never going to um, behave herself or, or, or do anything. I'm probably being very unfair to her now because she's, she's a great eater and she'll be mortified. She's 14, she's mortified by 
anything that's not Facebook. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and I just used mess and silliness with my wife um, and games and fun when she's sitting in the high chair um, to relax everyone and make her laugh and pop a spoon in her mouth. And I guess the thing that I copped onto then was food can be fun for kids, for babies. Food's fun. Food, food's part of our society. It's not just a functional thing. It's part of what we do. When we sit down and have a meal, the purpose of that meal is to eat, but it's also to socialize and to talk and communicate and that sort of thing. Um, so she started eating again, she, and she was prepared to eat new th stuff if we played a silly game each time. And I thought, hmm, okay, that's what we've solved this. I talked to other parents, and they, they um, you know, we all play the little the game with with the plane. But um, it wasn't it wasn't a, a, a light bulb moment, as in groundbreaking. But for me, it started to think. I wonder if other parents can link that thing between food and fun. And if you can make that food healthy, then um, maybe everyone wins. And the second uh, piece of experience that I had had was my professional life while I was at Nickelodeon. And that was around this problem that we ha didn't have in 1963 at all and that we've got hugely now. And I will go on to show how I think it's going to be a big issue in the next uh, 50 years. And that's um, uh, our diets. And it shows obesity there. And obesity, uh, a, th a third of our kids are overweight in the UK and 20% of them are obese and it's getting worse. And it gets much worse. They'll die before we die and that's no good for any society because it won't exist. Um, but there's also hunger as the other side of diet-related issues, and there's an inordinate amount of hungry people in the UK today um, and around the world. So I, I was aware of those things, and I was aware that TV was being um, blamed for some of that, um, and um, I, we were trying to do our things there socially. Um, but I, I, I sort of link those two things together, personal experience of health and fun, um, uh, with, with food, and maybe if more people found food, healthy food fun, maybe we could address some of this stuff. So, um, and really I tried to bring together, I worked out, uh, ooh, I wonder if you can bring together three things that often work against each other with food. Um, health and convenience or handiness and fun, because if you pick a product it's likely to have two of those things and not the third, especially if it's a children's product. I wonder if there's a way of bringing those things together. And I guess I had the idea of a brand before I knew, had a clue what products I would put under that, that brand. And as I've talked to other entrepreneurs uh, uh, in subsequent years, most people start with a few products and build a brand around that. I, for some reason, decided on a brand and, and, and what that would start with and then found the products to fit that brand. Um, and I thought at my desk at Nickelodeon, as I was thinking, here's my resignation letter, I'm going to go on this journey, um, why would we be different? And I struck on three things um, together with a vision of why we would sustainably be different. And I'm very proud that we're still different um, these years later. And they are that we would put kids first. That was my kind of Nickelodeon experience. Kids matter. They control about two billion pounds of the UK um, uh, economy. Um, any of us that have got them will know that the holidays that we go on and the, the houses we live in and the cars we drive are all influenced by the fact that we've got children. And the toys and the clothes and the food that they see in the shops and they consume themselves or use themselves are hugely, hugely influenced directly by um, the, their views right from a very young age. Um, <coughs> so kids first. You know, it really surprised me that when I looked into the market, the baby food market, say, you know, everyone focused on mum. And mum buys that product generally. Dad's increasingly, and maybe that's a trend we should maybe in the Q&A later, the importance of fathers in family relationships and in bringing up their children. Um, but uh, it's fundamentally mum who does the shopping now, um, and most all of our competitors really target her in, in trying to convince her, and my just view is she buy it once, and if the baby spits it out, she won't buy it again, so let's try and get her to buy something twice, because her baby likes it. Um, second thing, then, was to try and be innovative and different. Um, any company starting up, has got zero market share and has to persuade some, either grow the market or persuade some people to change um, allegiance. And I knew that we weren't going to do that on price and quality, or quantity rather, um, alone. It was, we had to come up with some sort of innovation for the supermarkets to talk to us in the first instance and consumers to buy us um, after that. And um, very, very proud that we created the format of packaging of a pouch in the baby aisle. Um, you know, I, my observations of putting kids first was would the, this would connect with all of their senses. We could put nice bright colors and, and childlike language on there, but we could 
really engage a child with use the tactile uh, nature of those patches and the ease and convenience of them. Um, you know, and I also knew that we didn't have the IP over a patch in that, that market, so I had to br build a brand very quickly around using that technology and that, that, that packaging. But the whole market has will go to pouches and, and, and away from glass jars, at least, anyway, um, in my opinion, by 2063. In fact, by the time Mayella has her babies, which better not be before 2063. Um, <laughs> Um, but innovation um, is something that I think entrepreneurial companies are very good at. And actually, um, you know, I didn't know we were going to a recession when I set up, but actually innovation often comes through recession. A lot of new, new technology, new um, ideas come when big guys pull back on their costs and uh, look at their share price, and it creates an opportunity for more entrepreneurial companies to create new things. Um, and obviously, we've had to continue to innovate and think differently and be differently as we've gone along. And that sort of leads to you know, our view that we're trying to get the next generation of baby food. We're trying to innovate. Well, how, how will our food fit with modern families? And the third thing, really, that I, I thought of that could be uh, sustainably different was using emotion and using a personal story to build a business upon. Um, it had to be genuine and had to be real, but I hoped would connect with other people um, in, in the same same position. And when I looked at the marketplace, again, the baby food in the 1990s and for the 40 years before that, back to, 19, uh, to 1963, I imagine, was exactly the same. Everything was orange. There was about two brands. It was in a glass jar that hadn't changed for years, and the recipes were very traditional. And um, people had changed. Demographics, as you'd have heard first time around, have changed. People's lives have changed. Um, but that emotion remains. And people, that, I, I just thought, I can't believe this, because the most, the most emotional time we are as people is when we have our young children. And let's work with that emotion with something that they can buy into um, on that level and provide <coughs> healthy food for their children. So three things that I'm very proud are still different to our competitors today. And... Um, I, I, we thought, how can we bring these together internally to show our team and our new people that, that join what our, what our um, points of difference have been and how we thought about that, um, and to talk about the, the wider world. And then I saw on YouTube something that one dad had done on YouTube, which exactly encapsulates what I'd hoped Ella's Kitchen would mean to people. I hope that this, this, this works. Here we go. So... Yeah, we just found us something else that makes you laugh. It's done. Here we go. Here we go. Baby stew. So there you go on for about five minutes or ten minutes uh, doing that. The, 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 the dad doesn't give up. Um, OK, so that's how I thought about we might find a, a point of difference, a USP, if you like. Um, and then I thought, before I gave up my job, I thought, well, what am I going to be about? I've got to have a vision, and I've got to have um, a way that we're going. And my vision was, was not about sort of making as much money as, as you could. That was a consequence of using our products to encourage children to have a better relationship with food so that they would have healthier habits that will last their lifetime in a very long sort of way. But it's encouraging children to get good food earlier in life, to like broccoli aged six months so that when they're 13 it goes in their mouth and doesn't stay on the plate um, and, and other healthier choices like that. So how can we constantly try and give healthier diets to kids? And um, thought through from that, well, what would the mission be? And again, simple mission I thought of, well, I'd like us to be sitting in my playroom with no you know, the computer, no customers, no uh, phone and, and, and no money, thinking, well, I'm, I want to be the first global premium food brand for young children. And um, very hairy, big goal. And, you know, we, we could argue that we're there um, in, in terms of the premium end. But we helped create a premium sector in baby food and helped bring people um, that would otherwise make their own food see it as a substitute on those occasions when they can't make their own food. And the third thing, final thing that I thought, I guess, as I was thinking I want to set up a company was this real belief that the best companies are those that have profits and purpose to them. Um, you can see from the vision that's not about profit. Profit needs to come from that activity. 
Um, but those companies of the future, I believe, will be those that have a very strong purpose as well as can make money uh, and, and don't um, prioritize e either of them against the other. I can go and show some examples of that. So quickly, I thought I could take you through Ella's journey, our journey over the last few years. So um, we started seven years ago, seven and a bit years ago, um, and that was the first day, uh, two products on shelf, and oh my god, this has happened. Um, and there she was looking back at us, and I'm sure that will be the proudest day um, of, of my life. Um, except for my wedding day, of course, if this has been streamed live. <laughs> <laughs> and the birth of my two children. <laughs> Um, and I thought I could take you through that journey, those last seven years, just through a few numbers, and we can rattle through these. So we started with two products that day. Now we have about 90. Uh, we had one person, me, in that playroom, and paid for many years, um, and uh, now we have 57 down the road in Oxfordshire um, in some beautiful barns. Um, eight years ago, let's go, uh, parents spent nothing on our business, on our products, um, and over these last seven years, they've now spent about a hundred, or last, this year, they've spent a hundred million pounds out of their purses and wallets, which perhaps out of all what I'll talk about is one of the most surprising things, is that that means we've got the trust of people very quickly um, against these established brands to try and trust with their most precious um, thing, um, our, our, our products. Um, we're in 13 countries around the world. Uh, about 50% of our revenues this year will come from outside of the UK, so we thought international very early. And we have about 20% um, market share in the UK of baby food. Um, right, those numbers down there are the l position we've come in the league table of the fastest growing companies in the UK over the last four years. The numbers get bigger over the last four years as it's hard to keep that pace of growth, but it sort of shows a sustainability of growth um, in the, the Fast Track 100 uh, table. But the biggest number, literally, and the biggest number in our minds is this one, which is 1 billion, um, which is our, from that very first day leaving my job and sort of thinking through, there's a vision, there's a mission, how are we going to tangibly get there? How can I explain to people like in this room, but more importantly my staff and my customers what we're about? It was this idea of we would like to, how long will it take us to serve a billion portions of our food um, to young children? What difference will that have made? And we call that tiny tummy touch points. A, p a portion of our food is, is, is a tiny um, touch point um, to a baby's tummy. And sort of worked out a 10 year plan uh, to get to um, a billion. And that's the thing that we still, every day, every month in our office, when we have our group meeting, we've got these Perspex tubes with caps from the top of our uh, products in there and we fill them up and, and, and we see how close we're getting to our billion, but it's a, a very simple measure. What happens are you? We're about 350 million, so we're, we're halfway in and we've, we've done the first third. Um, so we are at a point now where every second of every day someone somewhere is having one of our products and um, that's how we'll land at the present and we'll, we'll see where we are in the future. So, so let's start to look forward and maybe not as far as 2063, we don't have a 50 year plan, I'm just to see if you, you guys do, but um, uh, what, what's the future about? Well, the first thing I think about is it's a very long time and um, I want to win over the sustainable long term there and therefore I want to be the tortoise and therefore we don't want to go to product market worried that our competitors are going to get some product there before us. We want to have the right product for the right price, for the right consumer need at the right time and, and not go off half-baked. And we've you know, made mistakes before about launching things too quickly. So we've learned from those and we, we, we'll do what we want because we know the consumer best is, is kind of what will come. It doesn't matter what our you know, competitors are doing. Let's be the tortoise. Let's win the race. And to do that, we need a strategy, as every company does. Um, but I'm going to argue that a strategy is a really fancy word for just the, those three lines. So how can you link your vision to your mission, to your five-year plan, to your budget? That's what a strategy is. That's all it is, so that when somebody who has a budget for £5,000 in our organization this, this year as a sort of junior manager or something, can see how them spending that will link to all the way up to what our vision is and it's relevant to our vision. And um, it also sort of encapsulates, it sort of gives you the, the, the focus of to make sure all these five things are in step with each other. 
and that you're growing at a sustainable pace. So that's, that's to me, what a strategy does, but we, we've got one. Um, and within that, it is about um, focusing on that vision and that mission from the very beginning and not being waylaid along the way. Um, it's very easy to think, you know, I get endless emails from cyclists who use our products. It's great for cyclists. It's great quick energy. It's very convenient. Yes, it is. I'm not going to advertise in Evans' magazine or something. Um, let somebody else do that. It's great. Please buy them, but I'm not going to divert myself from focusing on what the next product for a child is that will make a parent's life more convenient and make that child um, give them a healthier diet. Um, We've got to con the future is about continuing to be the best people to understand what a family is like in the UK or in Norway or in South Africa or all the other countries that we're in um, in 2013, 2014, 2015, 2063 maybe, um, uh, and, and really putting our energies into how best we can do that. Because my bet has always been the smaller companies are better at understanding consumers' needs and crucially reacting to them. So if you're good at your in your industry and you're good at your business, you can differentiate between what a trend is and what a fad is, and you go with the trend earlier than the big guys, and you'll get through. But that's how we focus on our consumer and our customer. So we're in the market where you know we work through the supermarkets. They're our customers. We need to understand what they want. And you know, I was thinking about the future the other day about them, and they're they're in this place um, where they have the big stores, the big superstores, and they're paying rent and all of that. And it's all about making sure they get a return from every inch of that rent that they have to pay. And yet we're in a world where, where they sell, say, big white label goods, uh, fridges and stuff, they're increasingly going to be bought online. And maybe from the same company, but they're going to be bought online. So what do they do with the spaces that they now have fridges and computers and televisions and stuff in? They're going to have to pay that rent if they've got long leases. So some of them are already thinking about society, you know, the profit and purpose, I guess. And there's doctor surgeries and there's pharmacies and things like that in some of the big stores these days. And I think increasingly some of the more social things, which is right plumb for, 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 for I'm sure all of you here today, um, maybe because they're such a crucial part of the community, maybe you'll see a change in the next number of years of maybe a, a, a pop up and purpose coming together with some of these big um, um, supermarkets. Um, but you know we have to understand how each of our customers is different, what they want, what, what their USPs are, and how we can um, provide our service to them. Innovation is something that we need to continue to do in the future. It doesn't have to be groundbreaking blue sky stuff. It just needs to be one step ahead of everybody else and exactly in step with what our consumers want. So a very simple thing. We, again, when we looked at this, we, we got it from Consumer Insight, and when we looked at it, we couldn't believe nobody had ever done this before. But we have this pro well, some of these products. This product... Actually, that one is the most popular out of all of these. It's a stage two product, so sort of a seven, eight, nine, ten-month-old uh, child will have this. We got started to get emails and, and Facebook stuff from consumers saying, my baby loved that. Now they're 12 months old. They don't like the Thai curry one that you do. I want to go back to that one. And we thought, well, why don't we make it lumpier and in a bigger pouch and a bigger pack and more appropriate for a 12-month-old and do exactly the same recipe further up? No one had done that before. You kind of think, and okay, that's a tiny bit of innovation, but it helps us in our supply chain and it helps provide something that a, 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 a parent wanted. So a uh, billion tiny tummy touch points in 10 years. We're at 350 roughly now. Uh, and to get there, I, I sort of think our future is all about sustainability in three aspects. Um, and I think all successful businesses of the future will think of, of these three things really. Um, the environment, the planet, um, uh, and how, that's the obvious sustainable thing. And how do our packaging and our water we use and electricity and all that, how does that impact the, uh, the, the world? Um, economic sustainability, we're a business. We're there for profit. We will reinvest that profit how we see fit, but in our mission it is to reinvest to improve children's health, but we need profitable relationships with our customers and with our suppliers to make that sustainable. So we will walk away from deals where they're not sustainable and you know from a very small, starting off as a startup business and dealing with the big supermarkets, you've got to be pretty strong to, to not be seduced by the fact that you're in one of them. Um, and then a social sustainability, and that's all about we want children that will live longer than us and have children that will live longer than them and um, in, in, a, in a world that is fairer and, um, and healthier. And we sort of try and put ourselves in the, in the middle of that, but we try and think of all of those three things. And I think, again, another thing about the future, things that are just coming through now, Richard Branson's doing his B team, something called B Corp in America, which is judging a company by per, a profit, 
people and planet um, and having financial statements and company returns and things that measure themselves on all of those things. Um, and I'm sure the most enlightened companies uh, like ours collectively do that these days already. So that, that, that was how I think our future is. And I thought, well, what, are the, what, what have we done that's successful? And how do those successful things perhaps be barometers of successful things that might happen for businesses in the future? And the first thing I thought was, I, I, I spent so much time at the very beginning thinking about why we were here and what we were doing and ingrained a set of values in our company that are one of the differentiators for us, not only in the food industry, the baby industry, but I think um, in, in, in business in the UK, in that we think we truly use these and live by them in every aspect of our business. Um, they were unarticulated, sort of in my head and sort of a bit vague to start with, and we've really articulated them um, in recent years. And talking to Elena, I can see a lot of them actually overlap in different language and things with um, what you guys do here, and I'll, I'll touch them. But I really think the companies with values are the companies that will succeed, and if those values are different than what society's values are, the company won't succeed. Um, so value-based values -based business. Um, I finally say that, that I think they provide this bedrock, once you've got them, they provide a bedrock for decision making, foundation for decision making that allow, allows you to address issues that you've never even thought of before in a consistent way. Businesses do that will be um, businesses of the future. Because they allow you to have a clear and simple mission that is based on the mission not being let's make 100 million pounds or let's make a billion pounds. Um, that is easily communicated. It allows you to employ people with passion. Um, I'm sure I'll touch on a little later, you know, people make up businesses and enthusing them and motivating them. How do you do that in the future? But passionate people we have tons of. Here are our values I'll show you and we epitomize them. This little guy is everywhere in our office and in our minds and he epitomizes everything. So he's, he's doing things there. So first of all, he's got a, a T-shirt on that says we're good to each other. And we like to have relationships with these big supermarkets that are fair relationships and not bullying relationships either way. And likewise with our suppliers and our, uh, and our um, staff and, and everything. So good to each other. Children play are taught to be good to each other. We like to think differently. We like to imagine things that people haven't done before and ask why that can't have been done. We like to push the barriers and be really entrepreneurial and take measured risks. Um, and we all tend to wear many hats each day of the week as well. Um, we want to win. We are ambitious. We are in a market that is um, very competitive. And my God, we want to win um, and, and get the biggest market share and get awards and the rest of it for, for serving our consumers. We wear a pair of uh, suit trousers because we're business minded. We're not this fluffy marketing company that has these pippy ideas. We are a business to make profit, and we can do that profit how we see fit, and if we tell our consumers and our, sell our brand around what we will do with that profit, and it's true, people will buy into that, but it needs to be a profitable business. That's the accountant in me coming out. Um, and then um, we want to be childlike. Um, we, we, we believe children have many great ideas. Um, they're unencumbered uh, by many of the things that we teach them later to discriminate and to have opinions about things that are um, not, you know, they're not inane in themselves, they're, they're taught them. Um, but they have these fantastic imaginations and to be childlike and not childish is the, is the critical thing there. So they run through everything that we do from recruitment through to performances, bonuses, the way we treat um, our customers and the way our office looks. So that was one thing about values. Second thing is continue to be consumer obsessed. Conti continue to be the best people to understand what the trends are, what people want, how we can best provide that um, in an economic way. And you know, we have this whole cycle of we identify how what might be missing in the marketplace, not by sitting down having brainstorming ideas and, and, and blue sky ideas. That comes later. We go and accompany people shopping. We go and accompany people as they cook with a toddler and a, a baby in a high chair and wonder how they um, work and how, how that family works and then come up with the ideas and then develop them 
touching them all the time and sort of making sure that they're, the focus groups tell us we get it right. And then at launch, we'll have an interactive multimedia um, marketing campaign so that we can get feedback. And then down the line, when a customer has reason to call us on our care lines, uh, we can feed back that, that feedback that we've got right back into the beginning of the cycle again. Third final thing about success is an awesome team. Absolutely um, critical. An entrepreneur might have these ideas. Nine out of ten times they'll be useless at implementing them. Um, and uh, everything comes from the teamwork and getting those people motivated, employing the right people, and making sure that everything is a collective thing um, that makes you successful. It allows you to have one team with one goal from kind of one person. How does that happen? Um, with a lot of hard work to make sure everyone's aligned, all pulling in the same way. Um, loads of hard work, uh, teamwork, uh, but all of those things together allow us to really punch above our weight. You know, I, I really have no right standing here, and you guys have got bigger business probably than, than, than us, um, uh, and uh, you know, it's 20% market share, that's not 70% market share, but we punch above our weight in the media, in our industry, um, and um, in, in the things that we're trying to do, and we're very proud of that, because I think of those three things which will be important for the future. Recognized as the food and drink, drink brand of the year in 2011, sort of against the big boys because of those things I've just talked about. And in Sweden a year later, and in Norway last year, um, which are big achievements. These are going up against people like Carlsberg and Pepsi Cola and people like that. Uh, very, very proud. Very proud of the National Business Awards for this, this year. No, Bromford did um, very well again and, and, and got through to the finals. Um, I was honored to be the entrepreneur of the year. And I think because of through the interview process, uh, you know, it touched on those things about values and about purpose as well as profit. And, and last month, I was uh, the director of the year as well. So things I've learned um, along the way. First of all, this will be true in six years' time. In, uh, in 50 years' time, there are only six ways any business can grow, I believe. It's either you get more customers. You get more people to buy you who haven't bought you before. Uh, or you get existing customers to buy you more times. Buy six this week instead of five. And that will hugely grow our business. So how can we do that with marketing and, and, and um, groups, clubs, and things like that? Get more products. Find more occasions where people want your product that isn't going to cannibalize your first product. Go to more territories. Um, Fundamental belief that people around the world are more the same than they're different. I think we saw that with the way people laugh, and the way, but certainly with where they bring up their children. They love them equally around the world. Their children will grow teeth and get the clasp grip and everything at the same time, more or less, communicate in the same way. And our products are equally applicable wherever they are around the world, um, as long as we understand the cultures. Fifth way would be to be more efficient, to be able to recycle your cash with the optimal amount of stock and the right relationship with your debtors and creditors so you can do more with your cash for the same amount of profit you're making. And do M&A, be bought, buy people, merge, that sort of thing. And this year, uh, five, six months ago now, I sold our business to a partner, um, still chief executive, still run it as a standalone business, but I sold it to an American company so that we could grow our American business quicker with less risk, um, with the same values. And if you're going to do M&A, I think there's three words there, three plays on the word value there that are critically important. This is how I thought about them. Um, it's do these guys have the same values as me? Can I, I'm going to have to work with them. I, I want to work with them for the future. We've got to see the world the same way. Are we going to hit the same value of what we think the company is worth? And then after the deal, are we going to add? Are they going to add value? Are we going to be able to take a pound out of the supply chain and put it to the consumer? We're going to keep um, our, our, the, the strategy that we've got um, with with more efficiency. Thought about that and um, got the right partner. Right. Um, those people that have or are thinking about setting up their own business, you are, if you're successful, you'll have great gut feel. And it's easy. That's all you have at the very beginning. I think this is a great idea. I'll ask a few mates. I'll ask a few sort of unscientific focus groups. And then you start to get a plethora of data. And you get advisors and consultants and auditors and all these people coming and telling you how you should do it. And you should use that. And that's great. But believe in your gut feel for, as an entrepreneur. And never, never lose that. And if it feels right, it, it will be right if you, if you can show success. So this whole thing about businesses of the future will be the businesses that are good, um, uh, and they'll be the better ones. And I thought I'd very run through very quickly um, a campaign that we've done in this, this year, which is nothing to do with selling more Ella's Kitchen products, but it is to do with getting children to have a more healthy relationship with food. Um, and it's called Averting a Recipe for Disaster. And it started because last year I saw two um, articles in two papers 
uh, in the same week. One of them said, brilliant news, girls born uh, in 2011 will live to, a third of them will live to 100. Um, so that's great news. So in, 19, in, 19, in 2063, um, that maybe even got higher. Uh, but uh, the week, uh, later in the week, I saw by 2050, half the people in the UK will be obese. And that's the same children, those adults are the same children that will be born in 2011. So what happens to society when you've got half of them living um, short lives and, and have health problems and a third of them living um, a long time? There's a huge society challenge there. So I got together three bre a breakfast, a uh, tea and a dinner um, with some eminent people. These people who kind of know about food, know about children and all sorts of walks of life but very eminent. Um, and we had a big debate and we did some polling um, to understand what parents' concerns and things were and we produced a report to society, to government, to business um, with a number of ideas in it. And I hope I can just show this video for two minutes and now I'm being told I'm overrun. Um, but this is, this is the, the idea we came. I remember a small company and this has got a lot of resonance. Britain is facing a crisis. The number of kids that don't eat any fruit or vegetables is rising. And if we carry on like this, by 2050, half of today's children could be obese. Diet-related illness already costs the NHS nearly £6 billion a year. We're seeing increasing evidence of malnutrition, with thousands of children across the UK going to school hungry. We need to avert this recipe for disaster. We spoke to some of the most influential people in the food and health industries, charity sector and media, who shared their insights and experience. They spoke about the importance of a healthy start. They asked, how can kids learn when they're going to school hungry? They told us to get cooking back into school and looked at the role of the media in shaping our food culture. We spoke to parents and teachers. 93% of parents said their knowledge of how to cook had an effect on how healthily their children ate. 26% of parents said the cost of fresh ingredients was the main barrier to children's healthy eating in the home. 87% of parents agreed cooking and food education should be introduced as a compulsory part of the curriculum. 96% of teachers agreed it's up to parents to encourage healthy eating. So all this means the food industry, policy makers, educators and parents need to come together to act now. We're calling for a food manifesto for the under fives, which we want the main political parties to agree to in their 2015 election manifestos. How could you help? Pledge your support for the campaign today. Visit avertingarecipefordisaster.com. So, you know, I think hearing what you've done this week and, and it really reinforces to me that our challenges of our society in 2063 will be solved by a connection, a combination, a collaboration between governments, communities and businesses and those businesses that choose to get involved in this sort of stuff will be the winners out of that uh, from a brand and a, a respect point of view um, but also a, a sustainable point of difference point of view and um, we have had a lot, I can run through really quickly the things that we've come up with that we want to increase the Healthy Start program here because there's something called WIC in America which is pretty fantastic um, we want to make cooking compulsory in schools and it's gone a long way to do that in the time since we issued that report and, and now which is it, it is starting for many children already. Uh, use the supermarkets again, the idea of they've got spare space, got spare assets. Well, let's get cooking classes in their um, cafes. Let's try and educate people how to budget. How do they spend? I have somebody accompany uh, young mothers um, around to budget and to understand um, read labels and that sort of thing. Um, let's get a food enthusiast in every school. Let us, those of us that advertise on television donate just 1% of that airtime to a public message about health. Um, the, the government spends about 50 million pounds on um, healthy ads, uh, healthy food ads in a year. The, the industry spends 100 times that. Um, so let's, let's match the government with uh, 1%. Uh, over, the, over the long term, 25 years, let every child have a free breakfast if, that, if, that, if it will increase their concentration. 
uh, and open up the professional kitchens where you've got such enthusiasts, such pillars of the communities in, in local chefs uh, to, to help their skills. So our campaign got a lot of press, a lot of um, support online and, and with some organizations, a lot of political support, and we're just launching a, um, a, uh, a pilot with a Leicester City Council. We're putting public money into this to work with us. So that's a good a business and government working together uh, for something called Start Smart, which will happen early next year. Um, and we want the manifestos uh, of those three political parties to include something to the effect of having a long-term strategy for um, uh, the under uh, health. So, just conclude now with um, my philosophy of life is be like a toddler. I think that they're, they're, they're fantastic. They're heroes because they're our um, main consumers. Um, but if we think about them, I think some real business lessons we could all learn from, from a toddler. Because first of all, they never give up. And as an entrepreneur, as a small business trying to cut through, you can never, never give up. Um, we were all toddlers. We were all babies. None of us could walk. We all fell over 500 times. We cut our lips. We cried. We grazed our knees. We walk. We never gave up. Second, we're trying to be creative. Um, toddlers are so creative. If we put a toddler here now, we put a biscuit at the end of the room, put five of them, they'd all use a different way to get to that biscuit and try to get there first. They'd cry and we'd carry them. They'd walk under. They'd be carried. Uh, they'd use this new thing of walking, but they'd, they'd find a way. Also, if we put one in the room now, they'd get noticed. They'd get noticed some way, and small businesses have to find ways of getting noticed. But toddlers are really honest. They don't know how to lie yet. So I see it all the time in our focus groups. When we give them a new product or an idea of a product, they'll throw it on the wall if they hate it, and they'll literally shake in excitement if they really like it. Um, so business should be more honest. We, we're in a world where there's open communications anyway. Um, you get caught out if you're not. Um, toddlers also show their feelings. If they're happy, they're happy. If they're sad, you know about it. If they're angry or upset, you know about it, definitely, with their tantrums. But I think the, the, the businesses of the future will be those that are empathetic to the feelings and the kind of humanness of, of, of how we operate in society. And toddlers use different strategies. So that's Ella's Kitchen. Um, things that are important I've learned on my journey is cash is king. Successful businesses run out of it. Um, it's not the P&L. It's the, it's the cash you've got in the bank. Uh, reputation is critical, and in a world where there's Twitter and stuff, that's um, on perception and not reality. If you're creating something, make sure you can protect it. Um, so it's no point being first to market, and then somebody else does it quicker and cheaper and better. If you want to be an entrepreneur, um, I think the three um, uh, best attributes are creativity, a passion for what you're doing, and a tenacity never to give up. Um, but I think any business, all businesses in 2063, as in 1963, should concentrate on their customer. Without a customer, you've got no business. It doesn't matter how, what your margins are or how great you think your technology is. The customer doesn't want it uh, when and, and the format and at the price they want it, you've got no business. So let's think of some inspiration to close then. Um, this guy, Albert Einstein, an absolute genius, as we all know, well, he had a great f quote which said, everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. So that means to me, um, you know, I'd have been the world's worst banker or project manager. I can't do any of those things. But I've kind of worked out the niche that I'm pretty good at and my team are pretty good at. And we're all good at some things. So we should teach our children to find the things they're good at and to teach our uh, uh, the people that we help in society to do that. Right, my favorite entrepreneur is uh, Anita Roddick from The Body Shop from the 1970s. Fantastic for women in business, fantastic for ethics in business. And she once said, if you think you're too small to have an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito. <laughs> we all know that's true. And I love the fact that we've been a mosquito. And my final hero is my son, Paddy, who as of yet doesn't have a company named after him, and he's kind of got an issue with that. Um, <laughs> The pressure is not from the bank manager or Tesco or anyone. It's from a four year or eleven year old now. But he was four at the time, and we were testing out our new products on our kitchen table. And I asked the kids which one they preferred, and, and Paddy said, "I like the red one because red's my favourite colour. The fire engines are my favourite things, and you can hold your breath and do a slurp, and it's yummy." And he pointed <laughs> to the strawberry one. So it's all randomness from a four year old, but it's absolute genius because we named our first product the red one because a four year old decided that it was a red one and not the strawberry and banana one. And that's our best product still. So you, thank you for holding on tight. Thank you for bearing with me for about a minute too long. But thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.
Thanks so much to Paul. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, opportunity to ask Paul some questions over coffee, um, and we are going to have a Q&A session at the end, so you will have the opportunity to uh, to grill Paul on uh, on some of those things as well um, after you've had a coffee break. I am really relieved that you turned up now, Paul, because the alternative was one of my team offered to talk to the next lot of contestants for I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, right. <laughs> and then or organise some jungle games. So I think that was that was so Could much better. That, break? that was so much better. So I'm really <laughs> really grateful that, uh, that you managed to make it. So um, coffee break now and grab a bite to eat then we're back in the room at um, 20 to 12 so thank you very much.
Wings. She's important, not guy. <laughs> Brilliant. We sold the story well. So we're going to do Q and A for Paul first of all. Okay. okay. Anything you've got out of it, you can say. It. 